That song we just sang a moment ago, The King of My Heart, I wonder if that's the key to everything. I wonder if it's about the heart and who's king in our hearts. Because what I think happens with Christianity and, and religion in general is that we turn it into uh, a list of do's and don'ts. We turn it into duty to be for, performed. For example, this morning as you came to church, what was going through your mind about why you should get through the rain and get to church? Why did you do it? Was it because you should? Was it because it's the thing you're supposed to do? So you came because you should. When you sing, you come in and, and people are singing, why do you sing? Is it because you should? And because the people around you are singing? And so you do it because that's what you're supposed to do. And then the offering comes and this process of giving back to God. Why do you do it? Why do you put anything in that offering? Is it because you should? Is it because it's the thing to do? It's duty? It's the right thing to do? Why do we do any of this? What if we've got the whole thing wrong? What if it's not about what we know in our heart is the right thing to do? But what if it's about um, our passion? Not, not what we know in the head, but what we feel in our heart. Because when you think about it from God's side, it does not say, for God so thought about the world that he decided that we needed a savior. God's not a heavenly accountant that looks at the balance book and then decides what to do. That's not the, that's not the story of the Bible, is it? It says, for God so loved the world. It was love that moved him. It was love that put him there to bear our sins on a cross. It was love. It wasn't duty. God had no obligation to us, no duty to fulfill. And he didn't do that because he should. He did that because he loves us. So what if the key to everything is who is the king in your heart? What if the key to everything is responding to God out of love? Like A.W. Tozer said, God is a, a being who relates with us after the familiar pattern of humanity. He, he gives and receives love freely. What if God wants to be loved? What if the reason to get up and come to church is because you really want to be with God? I mean, you can be with him all week long, right? But you want to be in his sanctuary. You want to be in his place of worship. And you want to devote one hour a week to being with his people and being in his presence, sitting under his word and, and singing back to him. What if the reason you worship is because you're actually singing to God? Not singing songs, but actually singing to God. What if, what if that's it? Your heart is singing, not your mouth is moving. What if when you give, it's actually a love offering back to God because he's been so good to you. And you're, you're like saying, God, you've been so gracious to me. You've been so kind to me. I just want to love you back. I want to give you a gift. Everything we do, I mean, serving at Cody, you don't do that because you should. I mean, you might. And if you're doing it because you should, you're a faithful soldier. But I'm not sure God's looking for faithful soldiers. I think he's looking for passionate lovers who do everything they do including waking up each day and deciding to live for him because he's the king in the heart. He's your biggest love. He's your first love. That's why the greatest commandment was not, Jesus didn't say the greatest commandment is you shall not or you shall do this or don't commit that sin. The greatest commandment is you shall love, right? The Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says the entire 
Bible is summarized in those two commandments. Did you know the whole Bible is summarized with two commandments and they're both about love, loving God and loving people? What if it's not about duty? What if it's about love? And that is why the writer of Proverbs, whether it was Solomon who wrote this verse early, he wrote most of the Proverbs, but early on, we're not sure if it's him or if it's father, his father David, but they said this, above all else, guard your heart because it determines the course of your life. Notice it doesn't say above all else, guard your head, guard your doctrine, guard your thinking. That's not what it says. Guard your heart because your heart is going to move toward what it loves. That's the way it is in life. Your heart's going to move toward what it loves. That's the irrevocable law of the heart. Whatever your heart loves the most, that's where you're going to go in life. And Solomon, unfortunately, whether he wrote that verse or it was his father David, he did not obey that one verse. He was the wisest man that ever lived, but he could not obey this one verse, guard your heart. Solomon had it all going for him. He was handed a kingdom by his father David. He didn't have to fight any wars. The boundaries were as big as they ever were. He had wealth, he had wisdom, he had everything going. In fact, it says in the, the book of First Kings, it says Solomon's wisdom was greater than all the wisdom of Egypt and all the kings of the earth sought an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom of God that God had put in his heart. The, the whole earth was coming to see Solomon. I mean, he had everything handed to him. You talk about love from God toward him. He had it all. I mean, this is the only guy that, that got to ask God for one thing at the beginning of his rule. God said, go ahead, ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. That's love. That's love from God to Solomon. And Solomon said, give me wisdom, because I'm young. I don't know how to rule. He had love coming at him. And early in his rule, maybe... The first, he, he reigned 40 years, 20 years into it, maybe even 30. It looked like things were going great on the outside. The world was beating a path to Solomon to see him. And in that chapter, there's one example of a woman who came, the Queen of Sheba. It says the Queen of Sheba, we don't know where Sheba was. It could be Ethiopia, it could be some other country to the south. Jesus just referred to her as the Queen of the South. But she came, she heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. And notice that. She didn't just hear about the fame of Solomon. She heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She knew and she heard and everybody heard that Solomon was great because God was great. And, and the world was getting the connection between Solomon's kingdom and Solomon's God. They, they were getting it. And she came. She heard about his fame. She came and uh, she came to ask him difficult questions to see if his wisdom was for real. And she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue, camels carrying spices, very much gold, precious stones. This was every day. I mean, when a king comes to Washington, D.C., it makes the news, right? Some king of some other country comes. You see the pictures. There they are in the Rose Garden. Our president, their king, their queen. This was happening every day. This was like just ordinary business for Solomon, kings and queens coming. So the queen of... Sheba comes, and she says to the king, after she sees all of his glory and sees all of his uh, palaces and even the steps he used to go up to the house of the Lord, she says, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I didn't believe the reports until I came and saw it with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. This is twice as good as everything I did not even believe. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. How blessed are your men. How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. You see how she's even pointing him to God. She's saying, man, you are great because your God has blessed you. And I wonder... I wonder if Solomon had forgotten that. I wonder if the love of God had just become sort of routine to him. All the glory, all the fame, all the people. I wonder if his heart had started to cool off a little bit. Just a little bit. And she was sent to remind him that it was all because of God. You are good. You are good. We sang it. You are good to me. 
And so the world's beating a path to Solomon's door. It says he became greater than all the kings of the earth. He was the greatest king, the wisest man, the most blessed man that ever lived. In, in wisdom and in riches, he was greater than all the kings of the earth. The whole world sought an audience with Solomon. You get that? The whole world was coming to see him and hear, to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. Every man brought a gift, articles of silver, gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, mules, so much year by year. Solomon had it all. And it was just everyday occurrence. Here comes another king. Who's coming in today? Oh, Egypt's here today. Okay, what do they got? Oh, they got horses, they got mules, they got gold, they got silver. What do they want? They want to talk to you. They want to see your glory. They want to see God through you. Next day, who's here now? Assyria sent a, an ambassador. They're here. What do they want? Oh, they want to see the steps you used to go up to the Lord. They want to see your glory. They want to hear your wisdom. They want to just take it all in. It was happening. The world was beating a path to Solomon. And it was being fulfilled, the whole purpose of Israel in the Old Testament. I've told you this over and over, but if you go back to Exodus 19, 5 and 6, at Mount Sinai, God said, look, I'm forming a nation, and here's the deal. If you obey my laws, you're going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, for all the earth is mine. I'm going to shine through you to the world. You're going to be the light of the world. You're going to be a city set on a hill. You're going to be the salt of the earth. It was happening. It was happening in Solomon's day around 1950 BC. The world was coming to see God through Solomon and the mighty things that were happening in Israel. And you know what's kind of cool is that's happening here today. It's happening in Novi today. It's happening right here through this church because the world is coming to Novi. I don't know if you've seen that. You drive around and you'll see people everywhere from different ethnicities. This is one of the most heavily populated areas with people from different nations in Michigan. Japanese people are coming. We have ESL and Japanese people are populating the English as a second language. They're learning about God as they learn English. And they're going back to Japan and they're actually telling their own people that they ought to take another look at Christianity because it's better than they thought it was. And they're finding that out here. Indian people are coming too. I don't know if you know that one of the largest uh, Hindu temples in North America is right here. It's uh, 11 mile on Taft Road. You can drive by it, go north on Taft, just past 11 mile before you get to Grand River, look down on the left, you'll see this gigantic Hindu temple. That's because Indians are coming here. And they're not all going to that Hindu temple. A lot of them are coming right here to Oak Point Church. And they're coming here to find the glory of God. Just like in Solomon's day, they're coming here to Oak Point to find out about God. I want you to see the story of a couple, an Indian couple, who came here to learn about the glory of God. And I want to tell you about what's happening with the Indian community right here at Oak Point Church. Watch this video. My name is Joshua Vinakota, uh, and this is my wife, Kalyani. I was born and raised by Hindu parents in India. And we were born in that religion, we were born in the traditions. To come out of it, it's a big process. My father's colleague shared gospel with him uh, in his workplace. And he brought him to one of the gospel meetings and when there he's hearing uh, gospel songs. Uh, he felt joy and peace in his heart and he, he shared that story with us and uh, this is how we were introduced to Christian faith. Previously my dad, he is a short tempered person, he get mad very fast. Then suddenly there is a lot of changes in him. In the beginning my mom was surprised. Uh, why he is talking about foreign God. Then later on um, when he shared his experience, uh, how he felt joy and peace in his heart, that moved my mother. I was observing my parents uh, closely and uh, I saw them, um, how their behavior before and, um, and how they changed afterwards. I felt Jesus Christ is something different. He is not like one of our gods. For everything, they have a hope. Uh, though we went through a lot of issues, a lot of persecutions, I was a teenager at that time, and I used to closely observe my parents, um, 
how much they depend on God and how much they trust God by their witness. Uh, I was attracted to uh, reading God's word. God starts speaking to me very strongly um, through Mark chapter 10 verse 45. Creator of heaven and earth left um, his glory and came, came to me to save me and he paid a ransom for many. I was convicted and uh, convinced that I was a sinner uh, and I repented all my sins as much as I remember. Um, I recognized I was a sinner, I need forgiveness. In 2009, Joshua and I came to move to Michigan. And uh, in 2011, we were uh, looking for a church and uh, we were driving around and we saw Oak Point Church sign. And uh, we noticed it's a very big building and uh, we wondered how come this is a very big church and uh, we want to come in and find out. And we came to know that one of our friend's family, Joseph and uh, Bina are also attending the same Oak Point Church. And uh, first time when we came in on one Sunday, Pastor Bob was uh, preaching the God's Word. And uh, we were very much encouraged and uh, challenged by God's Word and God kept a great burden in our hearts uh, to reach many people with his good news. Here we see a lot of uh, Indian people and in some of the subdivisions uh, we see every second, third person as Indian and uh, we are uh, seeing a lot of Hindu temples also around. So God gave that burden to us uh, to reach uh, Hindu religion people and Indian community because God has chosen us from that community and uh, God kept that burden in us. Uh, it didn't come naturally uh, for me to share gospel with others but by uh, looking at uh, mission trips, people who share their witnesses, that inspired me to reach out to people. In fact, I'm waiting for every opportunity, you know. Uh, if I get any opportunity, I'm eager to share gospel with, uh, with my colleagues or friends. If my uh, father's colleague didn't share gospel with him, uh, I may not be uh, sharing my story today. I challenge myself and uh, every believer to share gospel with others, to take a risk and uh, to tell others we are the followers of Christ. So Indian friends come here and now Indian friends are reaching out to others. Let me have our Indian friends stand up wherever you are. Indians, stand up today here. I know you're here. That's awesome. That's so cool. Next, uh, next Sunday from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock is an Indian banquet reception in room 138. It's going to be spicy Indian food and cuisine. So invite your Indian friends, and if you have neighbors or co-workers and you want to invite them 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock next Sunday, there will be a gathering. And I, I can see a day coming where Oak Point has community pastors who are not just geographical, but they're ethnically related, Japanese pastor, an Indian pastor, as we begin to reach out more. But that's what was happening in Solomon's day. They were the light of the world, the city sat on a hill. They drove by Solomon's temple, wondered why it was so big, and they came in to find out. And they found out God was at work in Solomon. He had it all. He had it all. Except for one thing. And that was the heart. And we see so many times today in the modern world, people who have all this potential, they might be an athlete, they might be a TV personality, they might be a politician, have all this potential, but then they squander it because they can't, they can't control their heart. I mean, they know the right thing to do. They know the things not to do, but they just can't control the heart. And so you come to chapter 11 of 1 Kings, the final chapter on Solomon, the chapter where he will be buried, he'll die and be buried. And you just, you read it and you just wish you could take this chapter and take it out. Because it, it could have been such a great life. He had a great father, the man after God's own heart. He was handed a great kingdom. He had wealth. He had wisdom. He had all this opportunity, the world coming to see God. If he had just finished well 
and, and died and been buried, he would have gone down in history as one of the great kings of the Bible, one of the great characters of the Bible. But he, he goes down in history as a guy who blew it all, squandered it all because he could not control his heart. You turn to chapter 11 and it opens like this. King Solomon loved many foreign women. There it is right there. There's the king in his heart. He loved many foreign women. Along with the daughter of Pharaoh, that was his first wife, we read way back at the beginning. He loved Moabite women, Ammonite women, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite women. I mean, he loved the beauty pageant, you could say. He just, he just was attracted to all these women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, because they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. And here's the telling line. Solomon held fast to these in love. Solomon gripped these women. They gripped his heart. And here's the difference between David, his father, and Solomon, the son. David fell. David sinned numerous times, sometimes for as much as a year, but eventually he would let it go, and God would be the king of his heart again. David was the comeback king. Solomon, on the other hand, he, you know, he was compromising a little bit right from the beginning. When he married the daughter of Pharaoh, it said in Deuteronomy, don't marry a foreign, kings were not to marry foreign wives. It says back in Deuteronomy, don't multiply horses. He was multiplying horses all the way along. It says he had 12,000 of them, a lot of them from Egypt. Specifically said in Deuteronomy, do not multiply horses from Egypt. He was multiplying gold and silver. Yeah, a lot of that was given to him, but he was storing it up. It says in Deuteronomy to the kings, do not store up gold. So he was making little choices all the way along, but when it came to these women, they were the love of his heart. They were the king. They were the queens of his heart, you could say. And really what happened is they pulled his heart away. They pulled his heart away from God. David would, would come back, Solomon just kept going. Solomon recognized what was happening. God even spoke to him and told him what was happening. God warned him of the judgment that was gonna happen, but he wouldn't turn back because he could not deal with this love in his heart for the women. It says, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. His wives turned his heart away after other gods. Well, wait a minute. How can a wife reach into somebody's heart and turn it away? And nobody can do that to another person. You can't reach into my heart. I can't reach into your heart. But what it means is Solomon's own heart was unguarded, and he let them reach in there. He let them become the, the number one love of his heart. And then he began to turn. And he began to turn after their gods. His heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. There's the difference. David kept coming back to God, and Solomon kept going away. And here's what happened. These wives, 700 wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And you know, you say those numbers can't be right. Well, just read the news today about modern day people, politicians and the like, and those numbers are actually a little bit shy of what we read about with some people today. It's real, these are actual numbers. This guy was accumulating women, just accumulating women. But here's what happened, they, they began to say to him, you know, we would really like the opportunity to worship the God or goddess that we came from, from our nation, we, we want our God. And you know what he did? You know that beautiful temple he built for God? That gorgeous temple. It took 20 years for him to build all of his palaces, seven years just to build the house of God. He began to fill Jerusalem, the house of God, the hills around Jerusalem with shrines for all of their gods. And then it says he worshiped them with him, with, with them. He worshiped those gods and goddesses with his wives. Now you have to understand something. He's become an idolater. Solomon, the wisest guy that ever lived, he has become one of the great idol worshipers in the Bible. Why? Because he held fast to the love of his heart, the women. That's why I say at the beginning, I think it really has more to do with passions than principles. I think it has to do more with the heart than the head. I think it's more about who you love and how much you love than how much you know. That's, 
That's why in the Bible, when Jesus was at this Pharisee's house, and the Pharisees had heads full of knowledge, but this woman came in, she was the town prostitute, and she began weeping at Jesus' feet and wetting his feet with her tears, wiping his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees, who had a head full of knowledge, said, oh, if he only knew what sort of woman this was. And Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he turned to one of them, Simon, the man who owned the house. He says, you know the difference between you and her? When I came into your house, you didn't give me water to wash my feet like is customary. You did not give me oil to anoint myself and cover up the body odors. You did not give me the customary kiss, but she has wet my feet with her tears. She has anointed my feet with her perfume. She's washed my feet with her hair. She's, she has loved me much, and you, very little. See, the Pharisees had a head full of knowledge but they didn't love Jesus very much. The woman knew very little, but oh, she loved Jesus a lot. And she goes away in that chapter as the hero. See, what's happening with Solomon is he's got all the wisdom of the world. He's got knowledge about everything. He knows everything about everything. He's a walking encyclopedia. He even knows everything about God. He knows all the commandments. And what are the first four commandments of the 10 commandments? I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not worship idols. I mean, it's, it's so obvious. And yet, he couldn't bring his heart to obey. Why? Because there was a greater love in his heart. He loved women. And he held fast to these in love. And I think probably the biggest issue today for us sitting here is not so much, you know, okay, I made it to church today, I fulfilled my duty, I sang the songs, I gave an offering, you know, I, I did my thing. That's, that's the should and should not of religion. And that's not the way to operate, because that's all up here. Well, I should do this, and I should not do this. You know, I think the biggest issue is your heart. I think the biggest issue is who's king in your heart, because you know what, that's the direction you're gonna go in life. The heart, is like a compass, and where it's pointed, you will eventually go. And that's why we need to guard our heart. Above all else, guard your heart, it says, not your head. Guard your heart. And God said to Solomon, because you haven't kept my covenant and disobeyed my decrees, and by the way, that was the outcome. He, he, he did the wrong thing, but it, was, it started with his heart. I'm gonna tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this while you're still alive. I'll take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I won't take away the entire kingdom. I'll let him be the king of one tribe for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. See, God still loved David so much, and David had loved God enough that God was still going to give love gifts to David, even though he's already dead. And so God takes this kingdom, 12 tribes, and he rips it apart. And 10 of the tribes he sends to the north with a guy named Jeroboam, who's one of Solomon's servants. And two of the tribes, the big tribe of Judah, that's why it says one tribe I'll leave you, the huge tribe of Judah in the south with the little tiny tribe of Benjamin in, in the middle of it, that became all that was left of the Davidic dynasty, the religion of Moses. The, the north went completely astray. The North, for the rest of the Old Testament, the North will be referred to as Israel. Israel will not be the whole nation. It will just be the 10 Northern tribes. And for the rest of the Old Testament, the North will be completely apostate. They'll have a completely different religion, completely different constitution, completely different priesthood, temple, everything. It'll be totally off for the entire rest of the Old Testament. For the next thousand years, the, the North will be completely off. And all that will be left in the south is Judah and little Benjamin trying to follow the laws of Moses and trying to honor the Davidic dynasty. Why? Why did God rip this thing apart? Because of Solomon. Did it because of Solomon. In fact, you get to the New Testament, that northern ten tribes. You know in the New Testament there's this group of people called the Samaritans, and they're hated by the Orthodox Jews in Jesus' day. In fact, Galilee in the north, Jerusalem in the south, the Orthodox Jews would go around Samaria to get to the south. 
from Galilee to Jerusalem, they go around because they didn't want to even touch Samaritan soil. You know where those Samaritans came from? Those are the 10 northern tribes. So by the time of Jesus, that's who they are. They are hated. They're called dogs by the Jews. That's the 10 northern tribes, all because of Solomon. And I think the, the thing about Solomon, and it's like this with us all, we don't play the tape forward enough when we're about to make these huge choices in life to follow some lust or some option. We just don't play it forward. And if we could, maybe we wouldn't jump into the passing pleasure of sin. That's what it's called in Hebrews chapter 11. It says Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You ought to look that verse up. It's in your notes, Hebrews 11, the passing pleasures of sin. Because that's what sin is. It is a passing pleasure. It's an opportunity right now to have some fun and to satisfy something in your flesh, something in your sin nature. It's an opportunity to say yes to something short-sighted, short-term. But at that moment, you know, if we could take the blinders off and play the tape forward and say to ourselves, wait a minute, if I get found out here, what will this look like? What will it cost me? What will it cost my family? What will it cost my church, my reputation, my community? You know, what will, we've got leaders now trying to get in office that if 20 years ago they had played the tape forward, it'd be a whole different story, wouldn't it? Instead, we spend 95% of our time looking what all these people did way back here. I mean, it's ridiculous. Our whole election is looking back 10, 15, 20 years. Wow, he said that. She did this. Her husband did that. Yeah, because that's how it works. And if we could play the tape forward of our own lives and say, what will this cost my life, my family, my children, my grandchildren, my testimony, my church? What, what will this cost? And then we weigh that. That cost for the passing pleasure of sin. I don't think we do that enough. Solomon didn't do that. He could have just finished and had the greatest life of anybody in the Bible with the world coming to see God through him. Instead, all of a sudden, a new king comes to town to see the glory of God in Solomon, and he, he walks into town and he goes, what, what's that idol thing up over there? What, wait, where's Solomon? They, oh, he's over worshiping Molech with one of his wives. Do you know who Molech was? the detestable God of the Sidonians. They've, they've uncovered statues of Molech. They found him this gigantic statue of a God with his arms outstretched like this and a big hole in his belly with a fire in there. And to satisfy Molech and to get favors from Molech, you had to give your babies to Molech, slide him down the slide into the fire and burn your children. Molech's one of the gods Solomon was worshiping and built a temple for. Where's Solomon? Oh, he's over there by that furnace over there worshiping Molech. What? What? I mean, the Queen of Sheba told me he was like he had these steps going up to the house of the Lord. Oh, yeah, the steps are there, but when you get in, it's filled with idol temples because of his wives from this place and that place. You see what happened? It was all gone. The whole thing was gone. And for the rest of the Old Testament, gone. Because Solomon decided that he would follow the love of his heart these women, above all else, guard your heart. That's why I think the biggest thing in this whole story is about the heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And today I ask you, really, if, if you were to sit down and you were to say, okay, right now, the biggest love of my heart is, and then you write it down. The, the biggest love of my heart, and you write it down, and I guarantee you that's the direction you'll go. Because Scripture says, above all else, guard your heart because it determines the course of your life. It's not what you know up here. It's what you love in here. And so what can you do to guard your heart? This, this story is sobering, right? Because this is the wisest guy. This is a blessed guy. Nobody had it better than him. How can you guard your heart? How can I guard my heart? 
I'm going to give you a couple thoughts here. They're in your notes. I, I encourage you to read them at the end. They're there. There's some comments at the beginning, too, about guarding your heart and living a life of gratitude. But here's, here's one thing you can do. Number one, you can recognize your heart seriously needs to be guarded. That's the first thing. You may think your heart is good, that it's a good compass, that it's safe, that you're like a good-willed person inside. I can tell you, you're not. There's something off about your heart. It says in the book of Jeremiah, it says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Your heart is off. Because of the fall, you have a sinful nature. So even the Apostle Paul said, the good that I wish I do not do, but I do the very thing I hate. Oh, wretched man that I am. I want to obey the law of God, but I see a different law in my heart, making me a prisoner of the law of sin. And then he cries out, wretched man that I am, end of Romans 7. That's who you are, wretched man, wretched woman, broken heart, deceitful heart. And if you don't guard your heart, it will take you down. It will take you down the wrong path in life, and it will cost you. And it will cost everybody around you. Number one, recognize that your heart needs guarding. And that involves, you know, a bunch of steps, like accountability partners, I think is very, very important, and uh, spending time with God, and so on and so forth. But the biggest thing you can do to guard against an illicit love is to replace it triumph over it with a greater love. I'm, I'm convinced that the only answer to an illicit love is a love that trumps it, that, that, that supersedes it. Not, okay, I have this illicit love, so I got a bunch of laws, and I got to surround it with a bunch of laws. It didn't work for Solomon. He knew all the laws. But if in daily life, he had focused more on just his passion for God, loving God, loving God and being loved by God, then he would have been in a position when it came time to slap God in the face and to shame God to the whole world. He just couldn't have done it because his love for God would have just been too deep. I think the only answer to an illicit love is a love that triumphs over it. And that's why Loving God is the greatest commandment, right? Jesus said, greatest commandment, love God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Love. And how do you do that? How do you love God? I, I think basking in his love, you know, a lot of us, we just don't understand how much God loves us. And again, he didn't just give you his son out of duty. He loves you. That's why the Apostle Paul prayed for the early Christians. I pray that you may grasp, that you may grasp how deep, how high, how wide, how long, how, how unfathomable is the love of God that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of the measure of Christ. What Paul wanted for the early Christians is that they would be able to grasp the love of God because when you grasp that, how much you're loved by God, That'll start moving you toward a greater love for him. When you realize right now today that he accepts you no matter what, no matter what you've been or done this week, when you realize how much he loves you, you see, Solomon forgot that. And I think like people like the Queen of Sheba were sent to him to remind him, do you see how much God loves you? Look at what God has done for you. And the more you bask in the love of God, you spend time with him, you meditate on his word, you talk back to him about everything, you sing songs to him, you worship with him in the car. When you're at the gym, you put on your iPod and your earphones and you sing hymns, you sing songs, and you let the love of God sink deep and you love God then. Then when that situation comes, it's not gonna be a bunch of laws trying to keep you from jumping. It's gonna be a bunch of love. And when there's a bunch of love in your heart for somebody, it's real hard. When there's a bunch of love in your heart for somebody, it's real hard to want to hurt them. And so I ask you today, who's king in your heart, really? That's what it comes back to. Who's the king in your heart? Who do you love more than anything else? And how are you going to answer that question? What is it you're holding fast to in love? Because that's what's going to determine the course 
of your life. Christianity is not about laws, it's about love. God so loved you. The question is, do you so love God that when you come to that temptation, you'll be able to call it a passing pleasure and you'll be able to live for the pleasure of God instead of that passing pleasure. Solomon didn't do that. And he made a wreck of everything. Lord, we just, we see this story and we're just humbled by it, Lord, because if Solomon could do that, we recognize we could do that too. And we come to you today as broken men and women. We come to you as people with deceitful hearts that could take us out, take us down the wrong path anytime. And I just ask God that you would purify my heart, purify it of those illicit loves. Because God, if my love for you doesn't triumph over those things, I'm done for. So God, whatever are those loves in our hearts today, would you begin to point them out to us and just show us by your spirit, is it money, is it possessions, is it status, is it comfort, is it security, is it people, is it a relationship with some person that's really king in our heart right now? Is it some accomplishment or is it you? And if it's not you, God, show us. Show us really what it means to be king in our heart. God, we're gonna sing right now a song about you taking it all, you having it all. And I just pray, God, that you would hear our words, hear our prayer through this song, and accept this song, God, as worship from our hearts, because it really is the desire of our heart for you to have everything, to have first place in our heart and lives. God, we, we commit even the words of this song and are singing it to your heart, from our heart to your heart right now, in Jesus' name.